Welcome back to the channel everyone. Today I want to talk about how there could potentially be one large short hedge fund that rules them all, including Citadel, Melvin Capital, Susquehanna and all of the others. So stay tuned and let's make some money. But before I dive into the video, I just want to let you know about the special Thomas James Investing promotion with Moomoo. If you sign up to Moomoo before the 30th of September and deposit $100, you get a free share worth up to $350, another free share with a guaranteed value of $50, and a third free share with a guaranteed value on top of that of another $30, linked in the description below. And now I want to dive straight in with the key information. So. This gave me chills when I discovered it. Am I on to something? Now, I don't want to talk too much in depth about the start of this post because it covers a lot of technical analysis on AMC. I do think technical analysis has its place, but considering AMC has been so heavily manipulated recently, I don't think we can rely too much on technical analysis. But what the start of this post is mostly getting at is that currently AMC has been rolling in mini cycles, taking two steps forward and one step back two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, and one step back, which obviously is very positive. And that's effectively why we saw a good run at the end of last week with a small pullback at the start of this week. And he expects us now to push towards that $54 mark. But now on to the important part. If this trend is respected, my next question would be, how is it doing this? It's too systematic to be coincidental, and it'd make no sense for a short hedge fund to be orchestrating it as it's uptrending. One possibility could be that long institutions are involved. Could they be responsible for lending the millions of shares that seem to come out of nowhere, allowing the shorts to drag it down, cooling off the market and allowing it to grind up slowly? This may benefit them as they would earn more money on the interest of their lent shares the longer this plays out. Or this could be completely wrong. I really don't know. Maybe I should see if the trend is respected before I get too ahead of myself. Now I did see a very, very interesting comment. How is it doing this? The Voltron Fund. The algorithm is slowly losing control. Or, like you said, it's being manipulated by other net long institutions by feeding it their shares to borrow. Either way, this is all synthetic. So I did some digging and came across some interesting research. The ultimate war game theory. The beginning, total return swaps, reverse repos, and the Voltron Fund. In the original war game theory, I lumped together Citadel and all its affiliated media, hedge funds, banks and other allies as the bads. My research over the past two months has now identified them more clearly. I have examined the SEC filings of more than 40 financial institutions going back to 1999, covering thousands of securities and identified clear patterns that link them together and link them to the GameStop saga in 2021. I have correlated the movement of thousands of securities and researched the people and places behind these companies to come to this conclusion. We are not just facing Citadel, but a global network of banks, hedge funds, family offices and other financial institutions who have created a de facto private stock market and hold the fate of thousands of companies, trillions of dollars and perhaps entire countries in their hands. I call this the Voltron Fund, but it is not a cosmic defender. This monster is completely divorced from normal market mechanics because of its interconnectedness. I believe there's a universal algorithm, Voltron Sword, managing the assets not of one of these companies, but of all of them. If one institution needs net capital, they get it from another with room to spare. If they need a loophole, they transfer the problem to a type of institution or market maker that can bury it in different loopholes and regulations. And sometimes they just ship it offshore to a regulatory black hole like Luxembourg, Bermuda or the Cayman Islands. Or to add one in there, potentially Brazil, as that's a name we've been seeing a lot of recently. Maybe what we're seeing around net capital days isn't buy-sell pressure from Citadel, but the entire fund moving assets to balance one another's books. We aren't fighting humans, we're fighting the wealthiest, most powerful algorithm in the world. We don't need to bankrupt one of them, we need to bankrupt all of them. Then the post then goes through some due diligence about how we link to all of these companies together. And obviously I'll leave the link to this post down in the description below if you want to read the full post for yourself. And he then lists out all of the names of all of the individual funds and institutions that are affiliated with the Voltron Fund. Some names we know in here all too well. We've got Archegos, for example. We've also got Citadel themselves. We've got Chicago Equity Partners, which is interestingly in the same location that Citadel is based. 
We've got Fortaleza Asset Management. We've got Glacier Capital that we've seen quite a lot of. We've also got Group 1 Trading, who have a very large short position in AMC. We've got Melvin Capital. We've got Opus Capital Group. We've also got Point72 that we've heard quite a lot about. We've got Simplex Trading, who also have a very large short position in AMC. We've got Susquehanna. We've got White Square Capital there as well, and many, many others. And he says, I think this research gives us a clearer picture of how certain things are possible like hiding 2,000% short interest. Now I do think the algorithm is starting to lose control and I do think it's battling a number of long hedge funds that also have their own algorithms, like Rentec for example. Currently it looks like the apes and those long hedge funds and Rentec are winning at the moment and hopefully this prevails and continues. To back this up, I have some very interesting data that I've just came across on Ortex to do with average age of shares on loan. This green line here shows the average age of shares on loan, and we are currently at an all-time high of number of days that those shares have been on loan. Now, as you can see from around this part, the average age of shares on loan was fairly flat. It did obviously then fall when a number of shorts covered their positions on this small downward move, and then again stayed relatively flat. What this means is that old shorts were still holding their short positions, but more shorts had been steadily opened in order to keep it fairly flat. Obviously, old shorts will be getting even older and increasing the average number of days of those shares being on loan, but there were new shorts opened and therefore decreasing that or holding it fairly steady. But as you can see at this point here, that all stopped. And ever since, the average age of shares on loan has been steadily increasing. What this largely means is that old shorts are still holding their shorts, but there isn't really that influx of new shorts. Now, obviously, new shorts haven't just entirely stopped because we still see a large number of shares being shorted every single day. But what this is showing is that old shorts still aren't covering their short positions because they can't, because if they did, they'd be bankrupted. But what we are seeing is less new shorts entering the market than before. This all goes back to my theory that shorts have effectively run out of shares to short in the dark pool and are struggling to create more synthetic shares because of the new cats ruling. What I expect to see is this average age of shorts or shares on loan continuing to increase because obviously the older shorts aren't covering their positions and are trying their absolute hardest to not cover because it had bankrupt them. And there's a very small number of new shorts entering the market. At some point, I expect this line of average number of days on loan to absolutely skyrocket at the point that no new shorts can enter the market. When this line starts increasing even more rapidly than it already is and goes basically vertical, that will be the point when the short squeeze happens. I also wanted to give you a bit of an update on the Evergrande Group. This is their share price over the last week. As you can see on Friday, it was around 3.6 Hong Kong dollars. That has fallen consistently every single day this week and is now sitting at only 2.6 Hong Kong dollars. That means that over the last week, the Evergrande Group has lost 33% of its stock value. Obviously over six months, it's lost a lot more, previously being valued as high as nearly 20 Hong Kong dollars. I do think we're only a matter of days before Evergrande declares bankruptcy. And actually, we now know just how many days that's going to be. Now, there's two main dates coming up. The Evergrande Group have a debt obligation payment due on September the 20th, and they also have an interest payment obligation due on September the 23rd. And it's looking like both of those payments are going to be missed. If the Evergrande Group fails to make that debt obligation repayment and that interest obligation repayment, they will effectively default on their debt and be declared bankrupt on September the 20th and 23rd. This effectively all links into my video earlier about how the bonds have recently been suspended and how some of the top executives at Evergrande Group have been drawing out their earlier investments. And interestingly, this seems to already be having a major impact on some other wealthy individuals in China. A Chinese tycoon has just lost 28 billion US dollar value in the world's biggest wealth drop. Clearly, this is already impacting very, very large Chinese investors. It wouldn't now surprise me if he has to go and sell tons and tons of US securities just so he has some liquid cash to move around in his portfolio. And finally, Dave Lauer has given us a very important point to consider on payment for order flow. Those who profit from payment for order flow and so support it like to denigrate those who are arguing for it to be eliminated. 
often by dismissing those arguments as uninformed or anti-retail, but they have yet to address the fact that we're making the exact same arguments that Citadel made in 2004. Obviously I have gone through this document before on the channel, but back in 2004 Citadel themselves were arguing for payment for order flow to be banned because they thought that it did not promote a competitive market. Therefore all Gary Gensler is doing now is agreeing with exactly what Citadel said back 15, nearly 20 years ago. Wow, that's a long time. But yeah, so it's very, very interesting how Ken Griffin and other top executives have now changed their mind and think payment for order flow is great and how Ken Griffin loves paying brokers for that retail volume. Guys, let me know down in the comments below what you think about there being one fund, the Voltron fund, that rules them all. And also let me know what you think about my thoughts of the shorts having run out of ammo, and that's why we're seeing this increase of average number of days that shares are on loan for. And also while you're down there, be sure to get those free shares with Moomoo using that special Thomas James Investing promotion. Just remember to deposit at least $100. And as always, guys, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out some of my others. Alternatively, subscribe to the channel and ding that notification bell, because that way you'll be alerted when I upload a new video. Cheers.